Hello everyone, and welcome to the Warhammer Total War Legendary Starter Guide for the Bloody Hands. This is going to be one hell of a guide, Legendary Starter Guides, due to the fact that it took me about 40 times to, to crack this campaign, due to the severe difficulty of the starting position. The uh, Bloody Hands have the Savage Orcs, which are a very interesting frenzy unit that has no armor, but... Uh, Unfortunately, it can't be a useful starting, like, standard infantry unit due to the high upkeep cost. The WA will be useful for, like, later game, like about turn 20 to fight the dwarves, because that's essentially your best way to deal with the dwarf stacks, so that will be, need to be considered. The Prophet is a very powerful lord, however, this strategy that I have compromised involves a very heavy blitzkrieg type of strat to head south. You will need to utilize the Prophet and some unlikely allies to actually win this campaign. The campaign will be compromised of essentially uh, three armies that you will have to build very early. And unfortunately due to the legendary difficulty, you will have a number of rebellions and the finances for the greenskins are extremely difficult to deal with but if done properly and every, and every move done like precisely you can get away with a very powerful army and victory now starting off you you're you are essentially surrounded by enemies the teeth snatchers to the southeast scabii to the north Border Princes to across the Gulf, and the Dwarfs to the far northeast. The Teeth Snatchers, can act you can actually do, in the first uh, turn, a confederation with them, if you sack, um, technically the second turn, if you time it everything precisely. With your agent, deploy him to get a 10% discount in the region. And since money is a massive problem, massive issue this campaign, focus on building money generation buildings right at the start. With uh, the Prophet, be very careful in the movement. Do not put him next to the border, put him right above this cliff, right at the edge. Be very careful with the movement, because if the AI spots the uh, your main force, they will actually move their garrison to the city that you're trying to get closer to. Yeah. Lot with the Prophet, build three Savage Orc units, and be ready. For this uh, Legendary Star Guide, I strongly emphasize in getting the uh, the DLC for the uh, Warlord and the King. The King and the Warlord. This, DLC, this uh, campaign desperately needs those elite units, which are essentially, like, the first three are essentially, like, considered to be, like, like Cav which is extremely useful to have in the early game. The army hasn't moved, and we now we could then begin our assault on the mine. You can easily auto this, you will take very minimal losses. If you're closer to the border, you would have to fight another garrison and take some heavy losses. And that's actually an army you can acquire through a confederation. However, this is a part of a campaign where you might have to restart a couple times because there is a specific building you want to get when you take over this territory, a must of fields. Essentially a building to build the uh, orc base. If you don't get the building on the first try, then I strongly suggest restarting the campaign. It's very quick and it's very important to have. Here you could immediately do a confederation with the Teeth Snatchers and acquire all of their territory and armies. You have to do this very quickly because you want to, you're essentially going to use that army that you just acquired and do a quick Blitzkrieg assault onto the uh, top notes to the southwest. However, due to, this is like, this is a very heavily RNG based turn. You can get a barracks, but unfortunately that's 900 gold, and why would you want to spend 900 gold? And you can get a boss tent and a gold pile, instead of the boss tent and a growth building. 
It's very RNG based, so you could keep restarting until you get lucky. Here's another campaign after a couple tries where repeat the same steps very quickly and then just continue with the campaign. There's when they show off that this is a normal initial challenge campaign, that's a complete lie. Maybe on normal difficulty, but not legendary. And it's hard to say no to 3,200 gold. We got confirmation that the barracks is there, and then immediately upgrade the gold pile at our capital. Because that's going to hold down for quite a long time. Continue with the confederation, and we acquire the second army. From here, we will set up a ambush to get that Topnuts army. It's heading back to its homeland, since the two snatchers are completely gone. I clicked on the Topnuts to check the distance it could go in Force March, so I can have as much movement once it gets close to me. So it doesn't like get outside my attack range. I'll use the, gob the Goblin Shaman army to wipe it out, to give it the 10% movement. Not to mention, since we have a Musta Fields, Give the Goblin Shaman three Orc uh, boys. From here, give the Prophet a Force Stance and, and position him right behind the radius of the Top Knots army. Get in front to basically like push the uh, Top Knots towards the, the village and your secondary army. And then get a very easy victory and suffer little to no losses. From here, since he's still in normal stance, you can build another three units, and then get ready, give yourself the 10% movement speed, and get ready for the Blitzkrieg invasion to the top nuts to the south. They still have two raider armies left. Wiping out the third is good, because quite often they'll try to like use all three armies into like one super stack. There is a beastman faction that also has to be taken out as well. And we'll be taking it, we'll be dealing with it next turn. It has to be destroyed very quickly before it uh, builds those totems in the, vill the two top knots villages to the south. I'm special. Now, since we're dealing this way. with them, with these um, beastman yeah. factions, the problem is I'm not in the attack range. I'll use, I'll keep one, the Goblin Shaman, in normal stance, and the. Profit in force more stance. So basically, because this is what happens all the time when you get in range in the radius of the Beastman faction. They're gonna tunnel away to try to escape because they don't want. You're forcing them to fight. And they're gonna try to escape since they're heavily outnumbered. So you have a high chance. If your men are in normal stance, they have a high chance to capture an army tunneling away. And trust me, you're doing yourself a big favor of wiping that army out because it's just going to be going after undefended villages and spreading chaos. And public order is already bad enough as it is on legendary difficulty. This port village, you're going to lose for sure. And the thing is, you want to lose it because if the top knots are not going to take it, the border princes will. And it's right next to their capital, so you're going to deal with the stack very quickly. Here we have the beastmen being wiped out do them the trying to tunnel away and it's an easy victory and you save yourself a lot of time and problems in wiping them out very quickly. Quite often the top knots will they might send both their armies both their raider armies but if they keep one at the capital that's better for you. From here you could choose to build your third army which is it's necessary. And out of all three bosses, most of the time I would suggest a orc war boss because they're just tankier and stronger. But in this situation, I had a goblin with blood feud, so it's hard to say no to that. So with the beastmen gone, I'm going to use the giant to the prophet's army to actually commit the, to the siege first before anything else. Situation. In the uh, overall status, everything's progressing as planned. We'll use the Prophet to siege the capital and use the Giant 
essentially as a way to attack the uh, the capital this turn and not need to wait for a battering ram. And then use the Goblin Shaman's reinforcements to back up to back up the Prophet in actually taking the capital. And we should the the uh, the Prophet's not going to take many losses. However, the Goblin Shaman will. Once the capital's out of the way, we have a direct path to take both villages very quickly. As for the uh, the capital, our homeland, we're building that third army to deal with any top knots counterattacks, the rebellions that are oh, coming, and the border prince. Border prince invasions because they they generally send about a stack and a half. If you're lucky, they'll send just like small raiding parties, but eventually the border princes will send a pretty well balanced stack of swordsmen, archers, and pistoliers, which is really tough to deal with. You're gonna need at least something close to a stack yeah. to deal with it. Good right, Simon. Since we got the giant, continue the siege, bring in the reinforcements, and then we can just take the town easily. For the campaign skills, I would strongly suggest getting like sta uh, sacking skills, but choose whatever is better for the combat scenarios that you're going to endure. A, bit, a mix between the uh, getting leadership and buffs for your soldiers and the campaign skills are both very good to have. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough movement to actually take the city, but sacking it was enough. The Goblin Sharma army is slightly wounded, but it is still big enough to take the village, even though it's really damaged. The homeland is building its own units. You're gonna build your uh, special renowned units, your elite units, back in your homeland to deal with the rebellions and the the threats that are coming to your borders. Here we have the top knots setting a counterattack, and immediately send your third army to protect the mine. I wouldn't suggest in building up your two villages due to the fact that you will have a number of enemies in the surrounding area attacking that region particularly, and there's no guaranteed way that you will hold it. What you will hold for sure is your capital, but those villages are prone to being attacked. If you really want to a region to hold its ground, you have to build defensive buildings, but for this campaign, for this faction, it just isn't enough. You have to continually funding your three armies to actually hold down this part of the region, the two provinces, your homeland and the southern badlands. That's going to require like two armies alone just to hold those two regions, while third army will, you'll use to campaign and deal with the major threats. For the uh, southern badlands, I would strongly suggest building a savage orc building so you can build some savage orcs for the profit since he gets a discount in actually in the upkeep as for units that are slightly damaged combine them together and you can save yourself a little bit of money you don't have to build like a very powerful third arm like uh, goblin shaman army just enough so we can actually capture that village to the southeast the red fangs to your east are not going to declare war on you they're too busy with the uh, the, nor the dwarf threats and the Grimgore to actually to even think about you. Here we got the uh, Top Knots army. And this would become an easy victory. That is essentially like their last army. And it could easily be beaten. However, fighting the Top Knots army and autoing the battles, I mean, I am taking a little bit of attrition. Going. Because then I'll have to fight the, uh, of war boss. the uh, rebellion army. And with a night goblin war boss, it's just not this that good. Trap. I mean, if you put a, a war orc war boss versus a goblin war boss in a 1v1, the orc war boss is going to win, so 
This is going to be a very difficult battle. I'm not going to play the whole battle, but in general, it was a very tough battle. When I was actually trying to get into position, the enemy rebel army actually rushed my position. And I was wondering, like, why? And it turns out that uh, apparently if you have the, uh, the fireball ring, it actually, like makes the enemy want to charge they treat it like artillery since you have like a ranged weapon so they rush your position so you can't just spam the ring of fire on the enemy and that com got me completely off guard thus uh i'll skip the battle and go right into back into the campaign this was a ferric victory and a very heavy loss for me but it was a victory nonetheless after that uh ferric battle i was honestly confused like what can I honestly do at this stage? Like, this is my home defense army, and that just took a very heavy hit to my troops, and I'm not sure if I can actually hold the, the, uh, the capital area. I can't chase that army and destroy it, and even then, if I try to, that would result in me pretty much, like, losing probably almost all those orc boys in the process. Thus, uh, since I can't move the capital to regenerate... I'll just build more units and just combine what whatever units I have want? I have at the moment. I have a decent amount of gold, so it's not a quick or big rush. I have to do it. And the rebellion has to is gonna stay there and probably just like generate more enemies. They're gonna outdo me in terms of how many troops they can actually create. With the capital secured, I'll send the Prophet to the southwest to secure that village as soon as possible. You cannot give your enemies in Legendary a break. You have to continuously attack their villages and prevent them from regrouping to actually build a new an army. If you let an enemy, like, you, let it, you leave it alone, you don't attack it, eventually they'll build a stack and they'll send it towards you. There was one campaign where I ignored the top knots. And I was like focused on the rebellions and border princes, and all of a sudden there's this top, this orc war boss top nuts with just a full like 19 units of savage orcs, and it was just ridiculous. They built that in about four or five turns. Since the rebellion is building more troops than me, I'm gonna use the garrison to my advantage and just continuously build troops within the garrison. With the uh, Prophet, since I'm not in range to actually attack the village, I'll s just go halfway and go into raid stance. Give my troops a little bit of fightiness and let them regenerate a little bit. With my Goblin Shaman, I invested a little bit into sacking because that's it. That's what I intend to do. Eventually, later in the game, once we start invading the Red Fangs to the east, I'll be using that sacking skill much more often. With our rebellion, I'm not too worried. Since the the, the renowned the elite units survived, I'm rebuilding my orc war boys. Let me think about it. So far, the no. homeland situation is good. Thankfully, the border princes have not landed on the shore yet, but the dwarf threat is getting much closer, and I'll have to be dealing with them very soon. Thus, I need to build a stack to hold the uh, homeland very soon. The second I get, I get the uh, option to build more elite units. Is I'm gonna take it. Those squig uh, renowned units are very powerful and really good to have. Even against the uh, like armored dwarves, if you send those squigs to like flank around and hit the hit the enemy from the back, they do some serious damage. They're ex exceptionally as powerful against the. Uh, the border princes and any yes, rebellions. When you auto these battles, you will win them for sure, unless the top knots built a defensive building, but that doesn't really happen. Not really that often. Most of the time, they'll build like defensive buildings when take when they take over the settlements near your capital. I'm pretty sure I let, um, around this turn that rebel army will attack. The uh, 
money situation is I'm, re I'm completely reliant on the sacking to get money. There's just not enough gold generation buildings you can get at the start of the game to actually fund three armies. At this stage, once you've secured all these top notch territories, you're going to send the prophet back to the homeland and you're going to keep the goblin shaman in the capital at uh, Golbaraz. Keep him in the South Badlands capital so to deal with any rebellions in the area. I believe the dwarves just took the Scabii settlement right next to me. It's not the main dwarf faction, but it's an ally of theirs. And now they have complete sight lines on me. So there's a good chance I'll be able to deal with them soon. Since I have the garrison helping me with this battle, it's an easy win. And what's even great is, uh, I was able to steal a siege weapon from the rebels. The, uh, the rock thrower. Because that's a really good to have. It gives, uh, it gives me the option to assault the, the dwarven cities in the first turn. However, with the greed skins, you have to be very reliant on the Wa. Have the Wa back you up when you're attacking cities. Don't just assault with, the, with, like, with your one doom stack. You will save your uh, a lot of casualties in doing that. I find it interesting that I just lost that elite unit and I could just build a new one immediately. I mean, that seems a bit uh, unbalanced. In a way, like there's no break or anything. I just build back the elite unit for the uh, the the goblin war boss. I just noticed that he has different skills, and it's like, okay, I'll get the uh, the dripping tips. So all my melee units have now poison attacks, which I'm completely fine with. It's just he you can't. Uh, he doesn't have the uh, buff to increase the damage of melee for your orc boys. However, I'm guessing that's why you would choose the poison types. Different, uh, different pros and cons. With the prophet, you will use your goblin shaman and the prophet to beat the uh, the rebellion army that's growing in the southern badlands. With your uh, main homeland army. Just continue building orc boys and continue building that stack. Eventually, you'll be you'll be fighting the border princes and the dwarves very soon. At random times, like in the later stages, you could check if the border princes are at war with other factions, and you could secure a peace treaty very early. While it is tempting to attack the border princes and like raid their area, in all honesty, you have a much bigger threat ahead of you, and that will be the dwarves. The dwarves are the serious threat you have to deal with, because um, if left unchecked, they will send stacks upon stacks of heavily armed, armored dwarves to your doorstep. In this situation, I would say using normal stance, force stance, to get close to this rebellion. Brought the prophet close into range, and then used the goblin shaman to get close and basically out of these victories. It's it, it is risky doing these autos, but uh, to be honest, I kind of didn't want to actually play this battle after getting a fair victory. I've been trying this camping. Uh, a lot of a lot a lot of times. Pretty good money, and I ransomed the uh, prisoners. I'm not trying to actually get a wall for the sh for the shaman, so I honestly have no problem in uh, ransoming back units. Get a little bit extra money. Unfortunately, in those uh, gun battles. Uh, I lost way too many Savage Orcs for the Prophet, so I'll simply just build a couple new ones and then spearhead an attack onto the uh, top, the last settlement for the Top Knots. However, the Border Princes haven't attacked yet, and I don't know why. Maybe they're still preparing an army, a raiding army, to attack? 
eventually they will come over. I'm the I'm their only enemy. So they are coming. I'm trying to maybe get a peace deal with the uh, dwarfs, but that doesn't seem to be an option. Sometimes you can get away with it. But I've noticed ever since the uh, Wood Elf patch, the, uh, the dwarfs have been significantly buffed. Like they used to be, lo they used to lose a lot, but nowadays they are almost always winning against Grimgor. Thus, uh, uh, that's pretty tough to play as a green skin for a faction nowadays. So far, everything's going according to plan. The top knots are gonna want peace, but of course you're gonna reject it because you don't need a, a green skin faction to backstab you. And plus, you can secure the whole province, so you can issue a an edict to actually you know, improve the public order or get increased taxes. Once you build gold generation buildings, you're gonna build public order buildings to actually like calm down the region. So you don't have to keep dealing with the rebellions. I've noticed that the uh, Border Prince army is approaching. It's just two raiding parties. However, I'm going to stay in range, in close range of my settle of my village, and set my army into ambush stance in case they do try to, like, go for the village. With the prophet, I'm going to build three savage orcs, and that should be more than enough to deal with any garrison stationed on the port village of the top knots i'm deciding whether or not i want to build an army for the like savage orcs for the uh, goblin shaman to deal with the rebellions but i'm just considering whether or not to deal with the uh, high upkeep cost it's really all about upkeep at this stage because i'm worried like if you go too close to bankruptcy because well, it's, it's, the uh, unit loss is significant once you go bankrupt. Surprisingly, none of the Porter Princes hit the ambush trap. They don't spot me, but uh, it's about it's about half a stack heading towards uh, my capital and right next to my main like third army. That's it. It was an easy one. You have to do in dealing with like the Born Princess. You have to put your main this army into your stance and hope that the AI do not detect it. Because when they don't, that's your best chance to actually eliminate them. Sometimes when you deal like a significant like military loss to like your enemy like the border princes you can actually convince him to sign a peace treaty unfortunately i wasn't lucky this campaign for them to do that however it is possible i know for sure that's not their main stack though that's like the they said in like a stack and a half so that's basically the half portion there's still a, a border prince stack still coming here, I'm still trying to decide, like, what kind of skills do I want to give to my Night Goblin War Boss army? And so far, Weapon Strength seems like the best choice for the uh, whole army. As for the Prophet, the Prophet will strike the uh, Top Knots Village. Once he's done with that Top Knots Village, I'm planning to do, like, uh, an invasion by sea. Onto the border princes. Maybe if I get closer to their capital or attack their villages on the coast, I could force them to sign a peace treaty. Because I do not want a full fledged war with the border princes. Because I have to deal with a dwarf threat that's getting very, very close. For the uh, southern badlands, I'm going to start building boss tents to deal with the uh, public order problems. The legendary minus eight public order. And as for the uh, my goblin war boss defending the homeland, I'm gonna essentially keep, just keep him near the uh, village, the village to the north. I'm trying to see if I can get a peace treaty yet, but uh, since they probably still got that stack on the way, they're not gonna want peace. 
Sometimes you can get away in getting peace with the dwarves, but uh, they're probably getting close with their big armies. So that's why they we just reject it. Though this is not a really big army, savage orc army, it should be more than enough to hit a couple villages. I'm deciding whether or not I actually want to give uh, the prophet the renowned units. But there's no need to... Since you could build uh, elite units in enemy territory, honestly, there's... I'll just build it later because the upkeep cost is just brutal. I didn't have enough movement to take the village, but uh, this time we'll just take it. I was thinking about making a vassal out of them, but honestly it's not worth the trouble to deal with a vassal. Just take it and secure the region. There's the Border Prince main army. And honestly, I don't know if I could actually take it on. There's a small raiding party right next to me. And I'm very close to death. So, I'm taking a really big gamble at the moment. I'm going to try to stay out of max range of that uh, Border Prince army. And I'm going to combine my units together, try to get a full force ready to go. And I'm just going to go all in, get all the elite units. And set the ambush. Nice. Learn that uh, border prince stack, and maybe Five, with the Sigma. with no. the garrison and my stack, maybe I can get away with a victory. As for since the I know exactly where the border prince stack is now, I can now right I'll build a couple more savage orcs for my prophet and get ready to attack the uh, the border prince capital. Because, from experience, I know if you sack the Border Prince capital, Orders it's easily powers. worth 10,000 gold. Thus, and its garrison is extremely weak. So, their armies are too busy invading my territory. I'll send the Prophet in, buy ship, quickly hit the capital, and maybe I can force them to sign a peace treaty. As for the south, I gotta get ready for another rebel attack, fix up the ports, but I'm very, very close to death. I am counting on the border princes to attack the uh, mine next turn. Almost forgot the, uh, the edict, but oh well. Some really high stakes right here. Will they take the trap or not? If they discover the army, then that's a problem. Unfortunately, they didn't. However, they did get slightly closer. I'm in range of both armies now. However, since they're raiding my territory, they forced me to go bankrupt anyway. Even though I'm, like, trying really hard to save. I didn't expect they would both go into raiding stance. I thought they would just go straight for the village. The Thus, uh, I chose to attack the uh, the small army. Even if they retreat, um, they were too close to me to escape. And plus, it's an easy plus four leadership I can get for the upcoming battle against the stack. And here I'm just preparing to land on the beaches near the uh, the Border Prince capital. It's not a powerful army, but it's more than enough to deal with the uh, garrison stationed at the capital. As for my army, uh, I'll set it uh, on the edge of the village. Because I really do not want to fight that Border no. Prince stack, because they're just not strong enough. The attrition that they just suffered in that battle is just not good enough. 
I need as many fully health units to actually fight that battle. As for the uh, Southern Badlands, everything's pulling pretty well. I got a bit of money. I need to get these uh, big boss tents up as quickly as possible. I made a mistake in this uh, campaign that I didn't move my agent to the you Southern Badlands to give me myself a 10% discount. However, since I'm guessing the Border Princess saw my army very close to their capital, that was pretty much enough of a threat for them to sign a peace treaty. And that's enough. Yeah, it sucks that I can't attack it, but I have a much bigger threat. The dwarfs are right on my border. They just made a confederation with the, uh, the purple dwarfs right next to them. And now I have a serious threat. I really want to make a military alliance with the Red Fang or Greenskins to help me in the war against the Dwarves. This changes everything. Now I don't have to worry about a, like, a Border Prince stack anymore. I can focus all my units to deal with the Dwarves. And thank goodness I don't have to chase that stack around my territories. Now that essentially there is peace with the Border Princes, both my armies, which <laughs> the uh, the Prophet's army that was supposed to uh, take the capital, I'll have him take the tower, the port, the port village, and I'll have my main army go for the village just north of him. He's very close to getting a Wa as well, so this is perfect. Perfect timing and the number of battles he's done. And good thing I kept growing his army. You need a decent number of units to actually make a Wa appear, so really good timing overall. As for the uh, southern battlets, I'll continue to build boss tents, upgrading some of the buildings, and just keep building boss tents to deal with the pub with a legendary public More order. I was being very careful in moving my main army. I'm not sure if I'm going to walk into an ambush or not. Because it can happen. You, you never know when there could be the AIs using an ambush strat. But thank goodness that the border princes are done fighting me. There's no movement from the dwarves. I got the wall. Now it's time to do a full-scale invasion on the dwarves. And having that catapult is also really nice to have, which means I can attack immediately if I think a target's easy enough to take on. For some reason, I've noticed that like a lot more often the walls don't come in a full stack, but half stack. Filled with monsters. I mean, I'm completely fine with it, but I don't know. I have the strange thing I've been noticing as of late. Now that I'm a, like, no longer near debt bankruptcy, I'll just continue hitting the dwarf villages and keep sacking them. I'm not planning to take the towns over. I mean, I might take them over just for my units to replenish, but I'm going to let the Orc Rebellion spawn and take them away. I'm trying to take as much territory away from the Dwarves as possible, so it's difficult for them to recuperate or recover. Because once you take out the uh, Thorgrim Grudge Bear, the Dwarves immediately will go into production for the next stack. Destroy their empire before Thorgrim Grudge Bear has a chance to come back. Not to mention, it'll be nice to take the tower because now I can issue a uh, an edict for the uh, for the homeland province.
I'll sack just because I have I put plus fifty percent into that. Get as much gold as possible. And I'll have the prophets stay in the homeland to deal with the ongoing rebellions. Or to deal with any counterattacks from the dwarfs. The tribe's ready! This is a very risky battle. I don't actually have a very strong army in the south. And I actually lost. <laughs> That's actually pretty bad. Unfortunately, yeah, I suffered a, some losses. I can't build any elite units. I'll build the uh, three savage orcs. They're decent units. Very expensive to buy. Expensive upkeep, but uh, I just need them for that one rebel army. Here I just like remembered that I still have that agent, so I just gave myself a discount in fixing those buildings. As for my main army, just continue with the, the uh, raids. The uh, the Red Finks quickly took the uh, settlement that I just sacked, which I thought was pretty funny. For this uh, village, I would take some get some serious losses if I attack, so I'll just wait for the Wat to back me up, then I'll attack it. You don't have to issue orders to your Wat to actually attack a certain village. Just let them back back up your main army, and treat them like a reinforcement army. The best time to beat a dwarf stack is if they're in a village, garrisoned. Most time the AI will think like, oh, it's unbeatable if it has a stack in a village, but not until it meets a uh, breed skin army with a, a wop behind it. I was concerned about the public order issues in my two provinces, but everything seems to be holding pretty well. I really want a military alliance with the Red Fangs and the Greenskins, but I mean, I'll settle for a non aggression. With the Greenskins, I actually have the option to get a military alliance. Why not? I could do a confederation with them, but honestly, with legendary difficulty and the the random provinces they own, I'll, I'll lose them very quickly. Thus, it's my goal at first is to destroy, do as much damage as possible to the dwarves, like um, like wipe them out. Then I'll bring back my armies and deal with the Red Fangs, Breedskins, and any of the other Dwarves to the southern side of the map. I'll focus my campaign later on to go to the southeast. As for the Border Princes, they have their own wars to deal with. They're not going to declare war on you again. They have a lot of enemies to the north of them. And in this situation, Everything was going pretty solid, honestly. I was not worried at all, just building boss tents to deal with the public order. And just waiting for the uh, reinforcements to actually arrive with my main army to the north. No mercy. It was double checking if I should build a siege unit. Attack! Why not? Yeah, since I'm already waiting for my reinforcement army. And there's the Dwarf King right there. And what's also quite funny, this Dwarf declares war on me, and it's not even allied with the main Dwarf faction. It just randomly declared war on me, even though it's, it doesn't even border me. Oh well. However, it does make the situation a little bit more difficult, because uh, now they're going to send a stack towards me as well. So I have to deal with a dwarf stack, the main dwarf army, and another dwarf stack. So two stacks are coming in from my east. Normally I would think about, yeah, maybe I should pull this army back and back into the homeland. However, I made a decision that I'll just keep this army, keep sacking and keep invading dwarf territories and just take them all. If I keep attacking the Dwarf Territories, maybe it will convince the King to not invade my territory, but to retreat and defend his own. 
Unfortunately, I have to deal with a rebellion uh, in my homeland and in the southern badlands. Since I built those three savage orcs, uh, that's what guaranteed me a victory in the south. As well as it's the uh, boss dance are starting to finish. I should no longer have any issues with the uh, public order in the south. Concerned about slightly about the dwarf stack, but uh, I'll just continue raiding and occupying right, these territories. I'm not planning to hold it though. I'll just I'm just trying to take them over, so I can let a rebel like an orc, orc rebellion take it over. As for uh, the campaigns goes, I was starting to confuse like which one should I also use. Since I have a couple of elite units, I'll go ahead and give myself more sacking percentage and give the night gob the elite night goblins a small bonus. No. It was very interesting to see how confused the AI for the dwarfs was. Like it did not know if it wanted to commit an invasion on my land or fall back to its own territory to protect itself. Unfortunately, I can't make a military alliance with the Red Fang due to the um, war between Grimgor and them. Just building, continuing to build uh, boss tents to deal with the public order issues. And it seems that the border princes are finally losing their capital to Astalia, I believe. Thus, no more issues with them. As for the uh, capital, I'll go ahead and build that up to tier 3 since I got the money now. It's incredibly difficult to like actually gain a lot of revenue with the uh, greed skins on Legendary. But uh, when you do, it's pretty good. This is not I'd rather eat a squeak. That rebellion's gonna be a bit of an issue. I don't want to get too close to it because then the rebellion's gonna attack my prophet's army. Thus, I'll probably move him to a side village and continue building savage orcs. Now. As for the uh, goblin war boss, I'll be ready to tunnel underneath the mountain and hit one of those two war villages. I has my mystic powers. I'm leaving. Good day. I'm going to stay in reinforcement range of the garrison in the village, so in case they, the rebellion does attack my main army, I do have some backup with me. Eventually I want to reach Carrick, uh, the main dwarf capital, and destroy that. Burn it, to sack it, and then raise it to the ground. Once that's out of the way, I know for sure that the dwarf threat is essentially gone. To the south, I see, I'm see i seeing positive numbers for the public order, which means I can essentially disp start disbanding these expensive upkeep units. And essentially transfer the uh, savage orcs to my profit. I'm getting very close to the bankruptcy, so I gotta, I'm trying to be as careful as possible. Well, so far, everything is going as... Well, it's, it's not going as according as planned. I was expecting the uh, board prince stack to attack, but it didn't. I was able to secure peace, probably because I was close to their capital. What is at the U now that I'm attacking the villages, I don't need to wait for the law. There's no serious garrison. It's worth a good chunk of money. Them 
This plan was going really well. The Dwarf King, Orgrim Grudgebear, is now heading north to deal with the Wa and the stack that's destroying his territories, which is perfect. I don't have to deal with a rebellion and a dwarf stack right up my doorstep. Since I was not able to reach the army with my prophet, I'll just use the garrison to attack. And since... Actually, you have to attack with the uh, prophet army to wipe it out, but... The army's practically destroyed, so I'll just force march the prophet into the... Capital. Thorgrim Grudgebar is heading north, which is perfect. The wall will be in range, and I'll have a, an epic battle. Just to be safe, I'll continue building more uh, boss tents. Because this is that this is the deal with the uh, mid-game to end-game public order issues once the uh, chaos event starts to trigger. I have a really nice path in destroying a number of territories. Thus, um, everything's looking pretty good, actually. No. I just, I'm just hoping that they don't send another stack from the mountains. If I have to deal with two stacks, it's, it's kind of GG for that, for that uh, army up there. But so far, everything is looking pretty good. I'm gonna start building some boss tents in the homeland region. So I can start uh, moving the armies mm, towards the Red Fang a little later on. I was just checking the diplomatic status of the Red Fangs, see what I can do with them. I mean, I don't have to do an invasion on them. I don't have to attack them. I could just do a confederation. I just want to see, like, how many units do I actually have to move in to the uh, Red Fangs to actually secure the area without too many uprisings. Probably have to send two stacks to secure the, uh, the provinces very quickly. Two to three. I was deciding whether or not I should go after the uh, king or the capital first, but eh, I'll just take the risk. I don't care about the 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 upset people in that area. I want the rebellions to happen. I prefer there be a rebellion there than a dwarf city. This is a very close battle, however, I'll just auto it. It's. It's hard to believe I'd lose with the, the Giant and the Prophet and the whole Savage Orc army. However, I was a little concerned in losing at this point because I'm doing so well. Thus, uh, I'd play this battle. It ended being a very decisive victory. Thus, uh, I'll go ahead and skip it because this video is already well beyond 50 minutes. So, I'll skip this battle and get right back into the campaign. Having secured a decisive victory in the homeland region, I can now finish off that rebellion army, focus in wiping it out and getting ready to deal with the dwarves to the north. And then I notice that the, the secondary dwarf faction is already crossing the border into my homeland. That's a bit of a problem. This battle, I was really concerned in whether or not I will win it or not. Because I've suffered a number of losses. My troops are all half-strength. And thus I'm going to just start combining them and getting ready for another attack. I'll just fortify myself in the capital. Maybe lower the upkeep. Check check north, and the perfect situation has just happened. Thorgrim, Grudgebear, and his stack are inside a settlement, which is perfect. This is when I can bring in my main stack and surround the city. The dwarves have the advantage in defense. However, when you bring in the Wa with your main stack, you will definitely win 100% of the time. Unless the dwarves bring a secondary stack to save the stack in the city. But your Wa should be like 
when you click and turn, the wash should be the very next unit that's going to assist you. I was concerned about the stack invasion to my east. However, um, I was pretty sure like if I could keep if I could hold the capital, and the capital turns tier three, and my prophet has a decent what unit size of savage orcs, he could he can hold his ground pretty well. I can't bring in reinforcements from the south. I'm gonna start disbanding more units because the public order is actually holding really well in that region. Now, if I get invaded from the south, I mean, it's going to be bad, but I'm not expecting the dwarves to to go for that region straight south. Attack! My units, my main army in the north is really damaged. Almost almost all the orc boys have half health. However, that wall will tip the balance to my side. The Waz and support the the small little ra the dwarf raiding army just basically just ran away. And from here, it's going to be a guaranteed victory. Basically, like 70 30, 80 20. That was a big deal. Decisive victory. Wa takes almost no damage. And decent amount of money and Thorgrim, Grudge Bear, and that stack is gone. That basically gives you about five turns. Five to six turns before Thorgrim, Grudge Bear comes back. So now I. So basically, at this point, this is basically a, uh, a finished campaign. Well, not finished, but a decent end for the starter guide. Having secured. Having beaten. Thorgan Grudgebearer, and now being right next to his capital, he has no more stacks. Now I can send my main force up into that mountain and sack and destroy and pillage those dwarf settlements and grab as much money as I can. I will not hold those regions, but I'll just sack them and then just back off. When I did go up there, a bunch of other Greenskin factions were just like swarming there and like Locus and just destroying whatever is left of the dwarves since they have no more armies so this uh, I believe they're called Karak Azul these uh golden dwarf armies I'll we'll call, we'll call them gold dwarfs um they, they did um occupy two villages right next to my capital however once they took it over they then just fell back. They didn't continue their conquest. They maybe they were being alerted when Grimgore was attacking their settlements, or the different, or the Red Fangs were attacking them. So they effectively just backed off. But and all in all, that is the conclusion to this uh, legendary star guide. I do realize that this is a very long start guide and there is some rng involved but uh i'm trying to get as many details as possible for you guys if you have any questions be sure to like write in the comments below because trust me this campaign isn't easy there is a lot of there's a decent amount of rng involved and the smallest mistake can result in basically your empire falling apart so I do hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.